over and talk about human language. So aside from animals, what do we know about human languages? We know that human languages tend to have five main components that we tend to study in the science of linguistics. I'm not a linguist and I greatly appreciate the work that linguists do because it's very complex science. One of the areas is the pragmatics. Pragmatics is the social conventions. The idea of how close together do you stand when you talk? Are you a close talker? Now with social distancing, how close away do you talk? Do you talk with your hands? What types of gestures are appropriate? What types of gestures are inappropriate? Are there certain tones that are inappropriate? Are there certain turns of phrases that are inappropriate? How do you keep a conversation going back and forth? Or do you shut a conversation down? So all the social conventions about how you use language is pragmatics. Then we have the science of phonology or phonological awareness. Phone means sound. So phonology is the sounds of language. So any audible sounds. And the smallest audible sound in language is called a phoneme. A phoneme is the smallest sound you can break that you can make and can't break it down further. A phoneme is not the same as a syllable, as most syllables contain multiple phonemes. If we think of the word cat, k, a, t, those are three different phonemes. There's also phonemes that exist in some languages, but don't exist in others. For instance, just new information to me is that French does not include a th sound, a th sound, or even a h sound. So English has two sounds, at least two sounds that French does not, versus French and Spanish have more of a rolling r sound that we don't commonly hear in English. In other languages, you might have a hard h and a soft h. A soft h might be h, and a hard h might be h, and that might be a sound you don't hear in other languages. And in some South Asian languages, we know that there are multiple T and D sounds. There is one where your tongue is towards the front of your mouth, towards the back of your mouth, and one with a bit more air. Now, what's really interesting is we can't always hear all these different phonemes if you didn't grow up around some of these languages. And so the languages you are fluent in, you're probably more sensitive to those phonemes, but the languages you didn't grow up in, it might be harder for you to hear them. This is the science behind why some people, despite trying their best, continue to mispronounce names of people whose names contain phonemes unfamiliar to their culture. It's the idea that if somebody had a very specific vowel inflection in their name that one person had never heard of or couldn't process that vowel sound, their brain actually can't pick it up and can't process it unless they practice it a lot. Then we have the science of semantics. Semantics is the lexicon, the meaning of words. When you look at a dictionary, and you're not just looking how to pronounce words in the dictionary, but you're looking for what they mean. So you look at what a giraffe means, not just how to pronounce giraffe, but what it actually is. It's a mammal with a long neck. This is what it means. And we think about semantics, we can also think about morphemes. This is not a drug. Morphemes are the smallest unit of meaning in language. This is complicated. This has to do a bit with the grammar, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this is the idea that if we have the word cat, it only has one morpheme. Can't divide cat down to lower. Although the word at is a word, it doesn't mean what we think it does. So the word cat is the smallest unit of meaning in that word. If we have the word cats with an S and it's plural, it actually has two morphemes. The first morpheme is cat, and the second morpheme is just the S. This is the smallest unit of meaning because the meaning shows that it's plural. In English, words that end in ed in past tense, the ed is its own morpheme, or ing is its own morpheme because it says something about verb tense. If you have a compound word, let's say playground, that is two morphemes, or bookcase, or classroom, those all have two morphemes. But let's say you have something like clock. How many morphemes does clock have? You might want to say it has k lock, but a clock doesn't mean a lock, so it actually doesn't. That's changing the meaning of the word. Clock is just one. But if you have something like clockwork, that's now two morphemes. So phonemes are the smallest unit of sound, but morphemes are the smallest unit of meaning. The next step we have in elements of language is grammar. Grammar, as mentioned, is the idea that the order of the symbols matters. This is the idea that you need to usually have an object, a subject, and a verb. And in most sentences, you want to have them. Now, each language might have a different grammar structure, whether you put the adjective before or after the uh, noun. But some linguists have tried to discover universal grammar and the idea that in all languages, there might be this possibility that there's these universal grammar structures that exist. And so the order things have to go in is the syntax of language. 
And finally, when we're talking about literacy or written symbols, we have to talk about graphemes. Graphemes are the smallest unit of a written symbol. These could be Greek letters, they could be Roman numerals, they could be Arabic letters or Hebrew letters, or they could be English letters, but these are all graphemes. So graphemes are the written symbols, phonemes are the spoken symbols, and morphemes are the symbols that have meaning that either imply what our noun is, what our adjective is, or they add some sort of complexity to it, like adding ly, ing, s, or ed onto things. What's fascinating about human language is we have many different human languages in the world, and depending on which type of language you speak, this can influence how you think. And this is the notion of linguistic relativity. Linguistic relativity is the idea that the way we think about the world is influenced by how the languages we're fluent in describe certain things. If you know a language that describes something, you're going to be more aware of that thing. We might have heard of the term schadenfreude. This is a German word that describes the emotion where you're happy about someone else's suffering. This is a pretty common term that's now been anglicized and we use it a lot in English, schadenfreude, but before it became anglicized, we didn't really have a word to describe that. Another word you may be unfamiliar with is that calm feeling that when you're in the forest, the sunbeams shine through the leaves and the sun reaches down to the bed of the forest and has this nice calming effect and you're just bathing in the warmth of the sun. That might be hard to explain in English, but perhaps if you are familiar with Japanese, you might be familiar with the Japanese term that used to describe this that I will mispronounce because of my lack of phonemic awareness, but I'm going to say it's komorebi. And so this is the idea that they have a word to describe that so they can appreciate it better. Now, some stereotypes about Inuit peoples say that they have over 50 words for snow. And while 50 may be an exaggeration, it is true that in lots of cultures there are multiple words for different types of snow. Regardless of your ethnic heritage, if you are a mountain climber, if you spend a lot of time in alpine environments, you might also have different words for snow, whether it's the crusty snow, the powder, or sticky snow. And so this is the idea that rather than having to qualify it, you might have better descriptions. And this can influence how you think about and how you understand snow. When you were a child and you were buying a package of crayons and it had the basic colors in it, what would you describe as the basic colors? But if you let people have an unlimited range to describe how many basic colors they believe there are, there's a lot of cultural diversity. For instance, the Japanese word for orange is very similar to the English word for orange because prior to interactions with Americans and English speaking people, they actually didn't have a word for orange in their language. They didn't consider it its own distinct color. It was more of a lighter red. And depending on where you grew up, you might be familiar with one shade of blue or two shades of blue, both being counted as primary colors. People who speak Italian and people who speak Russian often grew up considering a more cyan or turquoise blue to be its own distinct primary color, separate from more of a cobalt or navy blue. And these are not shades within the blue family, but they're just as distinct as red and orange are. This is how, based on what languages you speak, you might think about the world and categorize things and have different schematic maps. The last area of language we're going to talk about is what happens when we're multilingual. What happens when our brain starts running in multiple languages? Well, in short, good, good things. It's awesome to have a brain that runs in multiple languages. It's okay if you're monolingual. I happen to be monolingual myself, but I wish I was bilingual. And that's because bilingualism is tied with faster habituation in infants. It's the idea that babies can actually learn to recognize things faster. And bilingualism is tied with less prevalences of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia in the later end of the lifespan. Why is this? Well, that's because when your brain can run in two languages, it tends to be better organized. It tends to be strengthened. I like to compare this to the idea, if you're going to clean out your closet, by the time you're done cleaning out the closet in your home, you've probably also cleaned up a lot of other areas of your house. And if you're going to reorganize your brain to understand these two different languages, it actually helps to tidy your brain in multiple different ways. It enhances it. Rather than just running in a Windows software, it can now run in Linux as well. So it's the idea that now your brain can think about in possible different ways and your brain is much stronger. So let's talk about this in terms of what happens when you're bilingual. And we tend to define these two types of bilingualism as either late or early bilingualism. So in early bilingualism, this is when you start learning at least two languages pretty early on in your lifespan. Some researchers say before age five and some researchers say before age 10. But let's say if it happens before age five, what we know 
is that as you're learning the words in one language, you tend to also learn the words in another language. And because of this, your schematic maps and the networks in your brain tend to show mirrored images. What I mean by this is let's say you're going to learn two languages and let's say they're going to be Korean and they're going to be Portuguese. What happens here is if you learn the Korean word for dog and the Portuguese word for dog, and then you also learn the, name, the words for paw and nose and tail, they're going to be connected in the same way. So as you add Korean words, you're also probably going to add the Portuguese words. And as you add the Portuguese words, you're also going to add the Korean words so that your, your schematic network and your chain of synapses will look similar. This is really handy because if you have identical mirrored areas, mirrored networks for your brain that look very similar, you can do this really cool thing called language mixing. What happens here, imagine if you were to jump into a parallel universe or warp into an alternate dimension. This is what language mixing is like. You can follow your schematic map and talk in Korean, and then you can just jump into a parallel universe and start talking in Portuguese and keep right up where you were. Have you ever talked to someone who's bilingual in the same language as you're bilingual in? And you can have the conversation half in one language and half in another language. And it's not because you forgot the words. It's just more comfortable that way. That's you jumping to these parallel universes or doing what we call language mixing. And language mixing is possible because the synaptic trees are similar and they're mirrored for those two areas of the brain. So language one and language, language two are being connected in different areas of the brain, but the areas of the brain are parallel or mirrored. So early bilinguals, it's less onerous on them to become bilingual, and they have some really cool skills and really cool tactics. That being said, being a late bilingual is still a really beneficial to your brain. But what happens here is a late bilingual is someone who starts learning a second language after age five, after age 10, maybe after age 30. And so they have a fully developed brain that runs in one operating system. They're a Windows machine, they're a Linux machine. And so what happens here when they start adding on the second language, it starts off really small. It's just like a little sapling growing out of a much larger tree. But as they fully become fluent and bilingual, they now have grown that second network, that second schematic map, but it's not parallel. It grew at a different time in a different way, and it's not going to be similar. But what's really cool is late bilinguals do bring a lot of nice superpowers to the game. They have what's called the cross-linguistic transfer. Now, in order to do this, they start off showing a bit of a temporary lag. They're slower to learn the second language than early bilinguals, that's for sure. But because they've already mastered a lot of linguistic development in their first language, once they meet what we call the linguistic threshold in their first language, they understand the grammar, they understand displacement, they understand how to read in their first language, they can take all those skills and just jump it and transfer it over to their second language. Let's imagine you learned how to read and write completely in Portuguese and you're really fluent in your first language. You can write essays in it. And now you're going to start learning Korean. You don't have to start at the pace where an infant would learn Korean. You can take a lot of your understanding, even though the character structure is different, even though the grammar structure is different, you can take a lot of information and jump it over. And that helps you to speed up. Now you can imagine if you're a late bilingual in two languages that are more similar, if it's two romance languages or two character-based languages, it could go even faster. But either way, bilingualism is awesome for the brain.